All right, I'll welcome you all to the fourth Monday of the month program of the Upper Valley Democrats. This month, we are very happy to be hosting a candidate forum with executive council candidates, Cindy Warmington and Mike Cryans. There is a primary, as many of you know, uh, and, and the primary is coming up September 13th. And the Upper Valley, De the Upper Valley Democrats communities of Lebanon, Hanover, Lyme, Orford, and Piermont are all in the new executive council district, which we are not quite in yet, but which we will be voting on in September for that candidate uh, on September 13th. So we have, we have all been talking about the election in November, we know about that, but we also have a very important vote to make September 13th. The Upper Valley is uh, one of the larger populated areas, once you add our communities together um, in the new executive council district. And that means that the votes here in the Upper Valley will make a difference in the September primary. And so I want to thank um, executive councilor Cindy Warmington and former executive councilor Mike Crines for being with us tonight uh, and answering questions. The format of tonight's candidate forum will be as follows. We will start with opening statements by the two candidates who are with us, and they will each have three minutes. We will then move into questions, and we have eight questions for the candidates. Each candidate will have one and a half minutes to respond, and we will alternate who responds first so that it will be even. The candidates will then complete the forum with offering two minute closing statements. Deb Nelson will be keeping time and will give the candidates each a 15 second warning. And we will then ask candidates at that time to please conclude their remarks, uh, wrap up at that time. We don't want to have to mute anyone, um, but we do want to get through all of our questions. And so I'll ask everyone we're going to be fortunate to have a number of people asking the questions tonight from across the Upper Valley. And so I will ask both the people asking questions as well as the candidates to be mindful of time. I have a couple of announcements to make at the very end, but we will be concluding our presentation, our forum tonight at 7.15. We know that everyone uh, is very busy and we want to be respectful of your time as well. Thank you so much to everyone being here tonight. We are all in this together and the stakes could not be higher than ever this November. And so with that being said, I would like to go ahead and get started and I will invite Cindy Warmington to offer opening statement. Thank you. So I'm Cindy Warmington and I am the executive counselor for district two. Um, and I am running for re-election. And I wanna welcome you all to District 2. Uh, the district has been uh, redistricted and I am very, very excited to be welcoming all of you uh, to District 2. When I came into this office, I came with 40 years of healthcare experience, 20 years in healthcare, different jobs in hospitals. I was a laboratory technologist. I ran the blood bank at Lakes Region General Hospital. I went on to be a hospital laboratory manager, a hospital business office manager, other administrative jobs in healthcare. Then I went to law school and uh, I became a healthcare attorney and I chaired the health law section at Shaheen and Gordon uh, for more than 20 years. And, um, and then I um, ran, ran for office as executive counsel and was elected in 2020 and started serving two years ago. And for the past two years, I have been the lone Democrat on the executive council in a 4-1 minority. But despite that 4-1, I came into this sure that we could make a difference and that I would be able to use the executive council to really lift up our democratic values 
And um, despite the 4 1 minority, um, and I, I just have to say, Tom Sherman calls it the Warmington 4 1 majority. But um, despite that, we've had some successes, some big successes. Um, you may all remember when the Republicans on the Executive Council voted to reject $27 million in vaccine funding. Uh, by keeping the pressure on them, by executing a statewide communications program, we were able to um, really make them reverse their vote. And that was a huge success. Um, I'm going to talk more later about our successes in affordable housing, in Planned Parenthood, and in some of the constituent services that we've done from representing individual constituents all the way up to cities and towns, such as um, Sullivan County, we can talk about the funding for the nursing home. And so I have done quite a lot um, and, you know, on the executive council and um, made so many things that have never done be, been done before on the executive council. Uh, when I was running, I said that I would um, form a caucus, and I did that, and um, and we now have staff that executes a statewide um, communications program to educate voters about the importance of the Executive Council. I am, for the first time ever, coordinating very closely with the congressional delegation, with the legislature, which um, was frustrating to me that the council and the legislature weren't doing that. I was recruiting and supporting candidates, um, and, I, and we have we have um, actually recruited candidates for every district. So we've had a lot of success. Um, we have some tough fights ahead. I think what we really need on the executive council right now is proven and tested leadership. And I ask for your vote on September the 13th. Thank you very much, Cindy. And if it's okay, I'm going to address you each can, as Cindy and Mike, if that is uh, acceptable. That's great. Uh, can I just say that um, I couldn't see Deb, so if she's oh. holding up the <laughs> spotlight, I was spotlighted. So maybe you could just give me a, a ping or something. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Mike Cryens, please, for your opening statement. And I think Mike just- Can you hear me? Yes, great, okay. there you are. Uh, well, first of all, I wanna thank you, Karen, and the others who put this together. Uh, I know it's always a lot of work and probably the biggest job is people giving up their lovely evening to uh, sit around and listen to Cindy and I. Uh, last week, we were down in Hopkinton for an event for Hopkinton and Bow, and I'm sure we'll have a number of these before election night. Um, I grew up in Littleton. Uh, I, I probably thought, um, the last thing I would say is I grew up in District 2, but I guess now Littleton, all the way up to Littleton, Bethlehem, and Franconia is part of District 2, all the way down to the Massachusetts border. Um, while I was in Littleton, obviously I attended the schools there. I graduated from Littleton High School and then went on to Springfield College and um, ended up starting my working career as a school teacher. And then I went into banking and that's actually what brought me to Hanover 40 years ago. And um, after leaving banking and finance, I ran headrest for uh, 13, uh, I guess about 11 years. And uh, while I was at headrest, um, probably learned the most about one of the most common topics today, either between mental health and uh, substance misuse. In addition to that, I was 19 years as a Grafton County Commissioner, and, uh, and Karen is now the treasurer. And I, 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 were you there one term when I was there, Karen? And she came when I left, I can't remember. But uh, her time as a uh, treasurer, I was 19 years as a Grafton County Commissioner. And I'll tell you, county government is a wonderful way of um, serving. So if anybody, and in fact, our last one down in Hopkinton, one of the people running is running for county commissioner, which is great. So in addition to that, um, I was one term as an executive counselor. And um, I'm sure one thing that Cindy and I have very much in common is it is a wonderful form of government. Um, you mentioned it to anyone that lives outside of New Hampshire and they have no idea. You mentioned it to anyone that lives in New Hampshire and maybe one out of 10 has an idea. 
Um, it's a very um, quiet form of government. I thought county commissioner was, but I think being an executive counselor is even more misunderstood. Um, to come back and serve as an executive counselor um, would be a great honor. I will be. I am trying to reach out to a number of people and uh, convince people that I would do a good job. Um, while I was there, obviously COVID started. And when it started, um, I, I often highlight unemployment went from roughly 5,000, thanks Deb, to about uh, 118,000 in six weeks. And uh, hopefully I'll have an opportunity to talk a little more about that because uh, some of the things we have no idea they're gonna happen, but they do happen. Great, thank you very much, Mike. Our first question will be asked by Grafton County Democrats Chair, Ann Garland. Yeah, thank you. Um, and so I'm is, sorry, Mike will be the Mike will answer first, followed by Cindy. Sorry about that. Sorry, Ann. Um, so thanks. Uh, the Supreme Court's overturning of Roe v. Wade has effectively put reproductive rights on the ballot this November, with abortion policy now being decided at the state level. What is your opinion of Roe v. Wade, and how will you advance access to safe legal abortion as an executive counselor? Well, I'll first of all, um, I think everyone was stunned on our side of the ballot that uh, it was um, turned down because uh, the impact to women around this country is phenomenal. And um, while I was an executive counselor, I was endorsed by Planned Parenthood. And as a counselor, what we can do, I think the best thing as counselors we can do is not uh, nominate and uh, not approve someone like Gordon McDonald because he was dead set against uh, Planned Parenthood and all the things it does uh, and a woman's right to choose. I think the other thing we can do is make sure that all the justices that we do approve and there will be one, one of the biggest things we will be doing after November is that there will be a new uh, Supreme Court justice when Gary Hicks reached the mandatory retirement age. So I think that is so important. I think the other thing that we can do is go in right up front, and I know Cindy and I agree on this, that we would vote yes for Planned Parenthood, because that is the, the things, certain things uh, executive counselors can do, and that is probably the most obvious one we can do, is to help Planned Parenthood and to vote down justices that would not um, give a woman a right to choose. Thank you, Mike and uh, Cindy. Yes, so I am a, a strong advocate of uh, Roe v. Wade. I, I hope it will be codified at the federal level um, and maybe on the state level, but I hold out no hope for that. As many of you know, the executive council itself is not a legislative body, but it is a place where we have a, an enormous voice to lift up our values. And I have done that. I have been relentless in pursuing uh, the Planned Parenthood funding and holding the council accountable for defunding Planned Parenthood. I have demanded time after time that the governor bring that contract back to the council. And in fact, that is happening uh, this week on Wednesday. And we will um, hopefully, um, the other councilors will have changed uh, their minds and, and understand that these are essential, essential healthcare services that um, the women of New Hampshire need access to. And uh, in addition to that, I, um, as soon as the council defunded Planned Parenthood, I coordinated with the congressional delegation. Um, I am honored to have the endorsement of the entire um, congressional delegation, Senator Shaheen, Senator Hassan, uh, Congresswoman uh, Custer and Congressman Pappas, and um, coordinated with Planned Parenthood to make sure that those gaps were filled to the extent we could. There was a $500,000 dire needs grant that was able to be brought to Planned Parenthood that still left two of the um, abortion providers in our state with no funding, no state funding, no federal funding, and we are working um, very hard for that. You may have seen in the in a recent meeting where I held um, the gov governor accountable and said to him, I understand, Governor, that because he 
continues to say that nothing has changed after the Dobbs decision striking down Roe v. Wade. And I advised him that while I understand that for him personally, nothing has changed for 50% of the population, we've just been told that we are second class citizens and that I wanna see that we will not be treated that way, that women in New Hampshire will have access to full reproductive uh, services in our state. So um, I will continue to be a, an advocate for reproductive health care. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Our next question will come from Lynn Garfield, who is the chair, uh, co-chair of the- Vice. Vice. Uh, Vice Lynn Garfield, who is the <laughs> vice chair of the Lebanon Democratic Committee. And the uh, Cindy will go first, followed by Mike. Okay. Thanks, Cindy and Mike, for uh, joining in this evening. Public education has been under attack for in New Hampshire, especially over the last two years. The school voucher system is way over budget, threatening to significantly increase our property taxes, at the same time drawing down funds for public, which I call community, education. How important do you feel a public education system is? How would you protect it? And is there an opportunity for the current voucher system, um, i.e. tuition for private religious and homeschoolers to be reconsidered, maybe be reversed, controlled, or at least returning some of those funds to the public school system? All right, and so, Cindy oh. first. I just wanna so spot spotlight you. And so when I'm spotlighted, just Deb, if you could just give me the 15 minute. 15 second warning. I will so, um, yeah, thank you. So, um, so when it comes to um, education funding, the that the decision, the voucher program, and that decision is a legislative decision. It is in law. But the way that I have used the executive council to really lift up this issue is one, to challenge um, Commissioner Edelblut and question him repeatedly at our meetings about the overages in that program, about the fact that th that money is going to private organizations, that it is ultimately, if we need more funds going to come from taxpayers, it is draining public dollars away from public schools. And I, um, I work on a regular basis with NEA on this. In fact, um, before every meeting, I coordinate with NEA on any items that the Commissioner of Education brings before the council so that we can use those as an opportunity to educate the public. The council itself is not going to be able to reverse this decision that is made by the legislature, but the council is a great place to lift up those values and make sure that the public really understands. And so in addition um, to that, I have um, stood up to Frank Edelboot and taken the case directly to the public. So starting Hi. last um, spring, I um, started running public forums to really educate people about what's happening with public education. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Cindy. And now we'll ask Mike to respond. Well, first of all, I think the easiest way and the best way to improve public school education is to get rid of Frank Edelbo. Um, while I was on the council, I voted against his pay raise. Uh, he came in and sat down in my office, or I guess collectively our office, when we all five sit in the same room and said, what could he do differently? And I said, every teacher I talk to feels you're an enemy of public school education. I was a public school teacher for five years. Um, my two kids went to public school. I'm a strong advocate for public school education. Um, many of my friends are teachers. And uh, I think whatever we can do to improve uh, the money that goes to the public school education should stay in public school education. Because as we all know, the money that gets taken out has to come from somewhere. And it comes from their property taxes. And uh, so we're in a sort of a no-no-win situation when when Edelbo transfers money throughout the, uh, uh, as he foresees is the best way to do it. And I would be a strong vote against any of that money going against, but I do agree with Cindy. And as Ray Burton often would say, some things you just can't change because we're not legislators. We're part of the executive branch of state government along with the governor. Thanks, Deb, for the warning. Sure. <laughs> All right, thank you, Mike. Our next question 
will be asked by Lebanon, the uh, Lebanon chair, uh, the chair of the Lebanon Democrats, and that is Nancy Graham. Hi, Cindy and Mike. My question for both of you is, according to the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner of New Hampshire, in the year 2020, New Hampshire had 417 deaths due to related to opioids. The issue touches the lives of many, many Granite Staters. What would be your approach to addressing substance abuse disorder as an executive counselor? And we'll start first. with Mike. Thanks. Well, during my time at Headrest, um, learned a phenomenal amount about, I had served on the board a number of years before that, but when you're there and you see some of the parents come in and drop off their kids. And uh, when I say kids, they're 18 and above, so they're not little kids. Um, some would say, you're all I've got. And they know, especially with fentanyl now and the rise of methamphetamines, people are dying. And the analogy I used one time in a meeting is I said, I was driving down to Concord and I took a right and went towards Manchester. And there was one of the highway signs that said 98 people had died from traffic accidents, which is a, a real tragedy. But at that same time, I think it was almost 300 that had died from uh, overdose, especially fentanyl is so lethal now. Um, what I would do is while I was at headrest, woefully underfunded is the money that comes from the state to uh, especially residential um, treatment programs and counseling, woefully un underfunded. The other thing is mental health. I, I want to give the um, legislators that might be on uh, the panel, not the panel, but listening tonight, uh, a big thank you because they put in $200,000 to go and help headrest on their uh, suicide hotline um, uh, number. So anything that we can do to um, get additional monies into either uh, residential housing uh, programs or uh, in, in addition to that mental health. Thank you, Mike and Cindy. Thank you. So as I said, I, I spent 40 years in healthcare. And um, for me, a big part of that was working on the issue of mental health and substance use disorder treatment. I sat on the board of the Lakes Region Mental Health Center uh, for many years. I chaired that board. I later sat on the Riverbend board. And I also was on the board of the Professionals Health Program, uh, which helps to uh, address op opioid addiction among healthcare providers. During that time, I also, as an attorney, I also uh, worked on expanding access to telehealth, which was huge in the area of mental health and substance use disorder treatment. And as a, an executive counselor, oh, and I, I would al I also say that um, I was instrumental in early on in um, the state of New Hampshire actually had a law prohibiting the use of uh, methadone for maintenance. And so taking, helping to repeal that and to implement Medicaid assisted treatment. Um, as an executive counselor, I think one of the biggest decisions we'll, we'll have to make, and we'll make that before the end of my term, is who's going to replace Lori Shibanet. She has been a very great advocate for mental health and substance use disorder treatment. And we need to make sure that we have somebody in that position that will carry on uh, with that, with that kind of um, commitment to address this problem in a in a very f forthcoming way, um, and um, and I would continue to work with other counselors to get um, peer review substance um, counseling um, covered under um, the executive council, which has been an issue. <laughs> All right, thank you. I will ask the next question, as it's a, been a big topic, um, especially in, Leb in Lebanon lately. Uh, it's about on the topic of housing. Upper Valley businesses cite lack of housing as one of the major impediments to worker recruitment and retention. The COVID pandemic has only fueled housing prices and made affordable housing even more of a crisis concern. What is the role of state government in housing and how will you address the workforce housing shortage as an executive counselor? And uh, Cindy, we will start with you. So this, so I mean, just to say, this is a problem that we 
I hear about everywhere I go in every part of my district. Housing is a huge issue and we simply must address this. And we had the opportunity as an executive council to address this just a few weeks ago when the gover governor brought forward a plan to spend $100 million for housing. The problem with the plan that the governor brought forward was that it did not put any guardrails in there to ensure that that money would go to affordable housing, to workforce housing, and could have been used for market rate housing or lux even luxury housing. And um, I think that the governor might have been surprised um, that I had worked with all of the counselors on the council uh, to educate them about the lack of guardrails in this proposal and how it would not help any of our districts unless we made sure those guardrails were in place. And um, at that meeting, um, I led the discussion, I led the, um, the council in really demanding that those guardrails be put in place. And um, the governor had to step back and um, go ahead and put some guardrails in place. I worked closely with um, the housing advocacy groups to make sure that the guardrails that are in there now were satisfactory to them and would provide the protection that we need. Um, I think that is exactly the kind of work that an executive counselor can, can do around affordable housing. Thank you very much, Cindy. And Mike, I would like to invite you to respond. Sure. Uh, my real concern about the money that was proposed, which I, first of all, I think we have to put the money in, is that um, so much of it was going to go in clumps to the uh, big developers. And as you look around our district, yes, in the Upper Valley, we think it's busy. Um, maybe even Keene and Concord would get some of the money. But there's so many of those small communities would not even um, be able to get any of the money. So the money would end up probably more unlikely in the other four districts and not in district or the other three lower, the other two lower districts uh, and the one over in the C code especially. Um, the reason I'm so concerned is that uh, all you do is you talk to somebody and they'll say, and I'll give you a, an actual example. I was looking at an apartment, it was $1,200 a month. I figured I'd wait a short while get my sort of ducks in order so I could afford it, went back and went to, from $1,200 to $1,700. Um, people don't get a $500 increase in their pay in just a short period of time like that. Uh, we're seeing way too many people not be able to afford to hear. You look at the license plates that are driving from, uh, a lot of times you see those little insignias, people are driving quite a distance to come to the Upper Valley to work. And um, affordable housing is just isn't there. So I think what we have to do is hold the governor's feet to the fire and say, more of this money, instead of half of it going right off the bat to the big developers, should Darling. be for affordable housing. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mike. And for our next question, we are going to go to Peter Beardsley, who is a former member of the Lebanon Energy Advisory Commission. Peter, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Thanks. I was struck by the absence of any reference to climate change on the list of topics for tonight's forum. I wonder, I wonder what kind of influence you think you could have. What's your position on climate change and what sort of influence do you think you could bring to the Executive Council about this incredibly, incredibly important topic? Thanks. And Mike, we will start with you. Sure. Well, the other night when we were in Hopkinton, uh, a lady asked that very question. And um, we went through the evening and it really wasn't getting answered. And when it became my turn to speak, I said, I'd like to go back and answer Bonnie's question. Um, well, I was, when I was an executive counselor, excuse me, a county commissioner, uh, we did two things that had a dramatic impact. First of all, we built a biomass plant that took 90,000 gallons of uh, oil off the market. We went from heating buildings on the county complex 100,000 gallons down to 9,000 gallons. In addition to that, when we built the new jail, we put in a geothermal plant that um, heats and cools those new buildings. And um, both of them had a dramatic effect on uh, reducing um, the, the consumption of oil. In addition to that, 
we made sure that they went around and we've talked about that at the state level too, doing as many buildings as possible, retrofitting them just with lights and insulation and windows. It's amazing the amount that we have to do. It is a problem. And I don't, I'm not being glib about this, but um, many of us will get through life without the impact, but our children and our grandchildren are really gonna see the impact of climate change. And uh, you don't have to look far to turn the TV on tonight and see the fires that are in uh, California. They just realize how impactful or a Salt Lake drying up. So um, it is a concern. I will do everything I can to highlight what I think can be done. Thank you, Mike. And now we will go to Cindy. So where this issue directly impacts the council is with the, the appointment of the PUC commissioners, the site evaluation committee members, the Department of Energy commissioner, and um, the governor has been consistently nominating people to those positions who do not either do not believe in climate change or believe that their government has no role in addressing climate change. And I have been quite vocal about my disagreement about those um, appointments. Fundamentally, the real problem here is that we have a governor who believes in the continued use of fossil fuels. And he does not have a commitment to clean energy, he does not have um, a commitment to addressing um, climate change. And how, you, how I, as an executive counselor, can address that and do address that is I talked about the infrastructure that we put in place. So that means I hired staff to execute a statewide communications plan and to build bridges with the media. Because it is by using the media that we show people what the governor is up to and hold him accountable. And so that is really what we can do. When I say lift up our democratic values, that is really what I mean. Making sure that the governor doesn't get to do things without the public hearing about them. And so that is consistently um, the way that I'm addressing it. I can't change um, the, the, I can't change what the legislature does Fine. and I can't change the appointments, but, um, but I can continue to point out what, um, what is really wrong with the governor's policy. Thank you. I was muted, sorry. Thank you, Cindy. Now we will go to Kanan for our next question. I'd like to invite Alex Olson to unmute and go ahead and ask your question. Thanks, Karen. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Alex Olson. I live in Canaan. Uh, my parents bought this place in uh, 1966, I think it was. And um, it's been a little bit of a, a rough ride, but um, the reason I'm, I'm on this uh, forum is because I live here with my wife. Uh, we've been together for 46 years. And given the um, Given the, the nature of the vitriolic attacks now against the LGBTQ community in this country, I'd like to ask both Mike and Cindy, uh, what, what plans do you have to help our community? What have you done for our community in the past? And how can we uh, trust you to stand up for us when we, we are being attacked every day in the media by right-wing bigots? Um, Basically, what's what's your stance on LGBTQ rights, uh, and how do you how do you think you're going to proceed on the council uh, should you get elected to it with with making sure that our rights are not taken away from us? Thank you. Thank you for that question, and we're going to start with Cindy. Um, I just want to say that this is a this is a very personal issue to me. Um, my daughter and her wife have two, my two beautiful grandchildren, my son and his wife have another. Um, the idea that the United States Supreme Court will invalidate that marriage is uh, abhorrent. And it is uh, something I just truly have a deep personal commitment to. In, in addition to you know, my personal feelings about this, I make sure that we lift up diversity at every opportunity, that we make sure that, that we have all of the voices at the table. 
And I, I give an example of that. Uh, I just recruited candidates to run in the other four districts and made sure that one of our candidates is an LGBTQ uh, candidate. And that it's just so important that everyone have a voice at the table. And I am committed to that in terms of always trying to reach out and find um, people to fill positions in various boards and commissions um, that will bring all a diversity of perspectives. And um, I am 100% um, uh, committed to making sure that LGBTQ rights in our state um, are protected. Thank you, Cindy. And now we will go to Mike. Sure. Um, I view it as a civil right and you have a right to be marry the one you love and to be with the one you love. And, um, you know, I, I can't remember probably a day that I didn't know someone that was a good friend. And um, I, I just don't see it as, a, as an issue that should be held against someone, but I, I do know there are people that are doing that and would love to see it overturned. Um, when we're on the council, one of the best things we can do is make sure that does not become an impediment to uh, either one, a good position as a, a nominated person for a senior position in state government, which is one of our responsibilities. Uh, make sure that uh, judges and justices don't show a, um, uh, I'll say for lack of a better word, an ignorance to the issue and uh, don't seem to respect the rights that um, Mike, you must be we all have. And, um, you know, basically, my, I guess the bottom line is, as, as um, executive counselors, when we vote on someone, we should be voting on the best person for that job. And I'm sure that uh, that should not rise up to be an issue to hold someone back. Thank you very okay, much. Thank you both. Thank you very much. All right, for our next question, we will go to our state senator, Sue Prentice. Good evening. Um, one of the major duties of the Executive Council, um, as you both know, is to review and confirm governor's appointees to boards, commissions, uh, state agencies, and even the New Hampshire Supreme Court. So I'd like to hear from each of you, um, what is your approach to vetting these, these candidates? Can we start with, we'll start first. with Mike, please. Sure. Uh, well, good evening, Senator. Um, my approach has always been, especially those that have hearings, which are usually at the highest level of uh, positions, is to give them a, a chance to present themselves, give them a chance to have people either speak either for or against their nomination, and after that, um, gather up information uh, from my constituents. Uh, obviously, the most famous one that I was involved with was the um, Gordon McDonnell uh, nomination. Um, I know there were some people unhappy that I didn't come out the very first day, but I had told them that I wanted to make sure and hold that true for anyone that they would have an opportunity to have their public hearing and then um, uh, turn around and after that have um, uh, a chance to talk to people within my district. The people in my district spoke loud and clear, and they were very anti Gordon McDonald. And um, when I called the governor to tell him that I was voting against Gordon McDonald, I've often used this line. I, I said, if he could have climbed through that phone line, he'd have probably wrung my neck. He was so mad at me. Uh, but Gordon McDonald was not the right person for that position. And um, I think it was a, the best vote I made. Uh, in fact, I sometimes say, uh, um, whimsically that um, I'm the only one I know that had an, uh, a comic strip written about my vote against uh, Gordon McDonald to the tune of old McDonald. So uh, thank oh, you, Deb. Timekeeper is doing a great job. <laughs> you can right. finish your sentence if you want yes. to. Deb says time, I'm stopping. Turn over to Sandy. <laughs> My, my perspective on all nominations is that they need to be qualified and they need to be committed to the mission of the agency that they're going to serve um, in terms of judges that they are qualified and that they have 
all of the characteristics that we look for in a judge in terms of integrity and temperament and um, and um, and un being unbiased. So uh, I certainly look for um, their background. Uh, I certainly look to see if there are any um, there's been any public advocacy or statements that they've made in the past that would indicate any um, issues with that nomination. And in addition um, to that, um, I. I try to vet every candidate. I, I understand I'm the only Democrat. I don't think that the governor, I don't expect him to nominate all Democrats or any Democrats really, but I expect him to nominate people who are qualified and expect him to nominate people who are committed to the mission. So when I have a Department of Energy commissioner who doesn't believe in climate change, I don't believe they're committed to the mission. I don't believe that Frank Edelblut is committed to the mission. In terms of Gordon McDonald, I just want to say what is different now than what happened then it, it, at that council meeting is now that infrastructure that I talked about is in place. The governor following the Gordon McDonald nomination, the governor did not appoint any judges, any judges. He had like a little temper tantrum and didn't appoint any judges for 18 uh, months. And that could not happen today because we would hold him accountable through the media and not let him get away with letting our Supreme Court sit empty for 18 months. All right, thank you, Cindy. And our next question will come from Deb Nelson, chair of the Hanover Democrats. Thank you. And thank you to both of you for being a part of this program. Obviously, it's an important one. Obviously, we all are going to vote Democratic. Um, I guess my question is really the fundamental one to each of you. Why are you the better candidate? And it's that simple. Thank you. All right. And we will start with Cindy. So I am um, currently serving as the executive counselor and really have done some things on the executive council that have never been done before. As we said, the coordination that is going on right now with the legislature, with the congressional delegation. So when that federal money is coming through and the congressional delegation doesn't believe that it's being appropriated properly. I am in coordination with them to make sure that if the child care money is not getting out, that I am asking those questions. On the other side, on the state legislature side, making sure that we message together. This was really my recommendation after the 2020 election is that we needed to coordinate. We now meet bi-weekly. We have a coordinator through the New Hampshire Democratic Party that brings us all together. We are sharing vendors. We are, do we are messaging together. And those are things that have never Never been done before. We are also I, on today. I have to say, the issue in this election and the issue of the day is that women are under assault, and not just women, but all minorities as well. But um, other, anyone who can become pregnant is under assault, and women are under assault. And I have been a strong and powerful voice for women, for reproductive rights. I have done this my entire life, um, been dedicated to this, and I would continue to be this powerful voice for all of my constituents uh, on the Executive Council. Thank you. And now we will go to Mike. Sure. From my time as a county commissioner to the executive council, I have always made constituent service my number one priority. Um, I remember Ray Burton saying to me one day, he says, you know, we have an issue that rises up and everybody gets excited, but every day people are contacting me and need things to be done. I don't think that was ever for me more apparent than during COVID. Uh, when it first started and we saw the impact it had to closing of businesses, to um, the rising unemployment, which uh, is probably the only business in the world that I know of that went increased three, 30 times uh, from you know 4,000 4, to 120,000, which was a phenomenal increase. And the reason I mentioned that because so many people called for help because they had no money coming in the front door. And we all know you still have to, especially if you have children, you still have to buy food, you have to pay rent, and you have to do all those things. 
I, when I was on the council, I worked as hard as I could each and every day. It was my, my commitment. Um, it didn't make any difference to a Democrat or Republican. I wanted to make sure you were heard. Um, you always don't get the answer what you want, but you deserve an answer. So I would continue to make constituent service my priority and will work from Carroll and Franconia and Bethlehem all the way down to Winchester and over to Concord. Thank, thank you. you. All right, thank you, Mike. And the next question, we actually are moving along very quickly. And so I'm gonna be able to ask, uh, I think one or two more questions before closing statements. My next question is, um, I apologize, I just have to do it. It's gotta be somebody out there that hasn't asked a question. <laughs> um, the next question I would like to ask is about the economy. As the election approaches, by the time we get to November, many people will be feeling the pain of utility bills and having to buy oil. Um, electricity rates are increasing and a lot of families are struggling. Um, here, even here in Lebanon and Hanover, families are really feeling the squeeze. Um, of inflation. I'm wondering if you can talk about what role the executive council can play in addressing, uh, in, a, in addressing this economic uh, concern and how you would approach that on the executive council. And we'll start with Mike. Well, it was a similar question at the last one. And um, obviously the power and the effectiveness of the council wanes when you're talking about worldwide prices and stuff like that. But I think you always have to be very mindful. Uh, in some ways, it's no different than what we went through in COVID with the increase of unemployment. People are struggling. Uh, if you're in the grocery stores, it's not unusual sometimes to see somebody putting items back. I mentioned to you about the guy who wanted to rent and what it cost him. You hear you chat with a person in one of the convenience stores and they say, oh yeah, people used to walk in and say, fill it up. Now it's, can you give me, I'll give you $30 worth or some item like that. They can't afford to fill up their vehicles. Um, we have to be very mindful and uh, because I do think, Karen, this is gonna be one of the big issues going forward is the continued impact. Um, I was amazed when I saw the governor's proposing giving $100. Um, I got something today in Liberty that said the average increase is probably going to be $72 a month. Uh, that $100 that he's going to pass on to you is going to go pretty quickly. Uh, so, I mean, those kind of token efforts, I'm not sure make a lot of difference. Um, and, and the final thing I would say regarding that is that if anything comes across with monies that can come back into the state and can be used to help offset some of the cost. I'm, I'm for it, but I think with uh, the, the flow of money coming into the state, I think it's gonna to start to diminish. So I think, unfortunately, many of them are gonna be left on their own. So uh, I guess I would end, I saw the sign go up, uh, be mindful of it and do the best we can to make sure that we're always concerned about those that can least afford to pay for what they have to pay for. Thank you, Mike. And now we'll go to Cindy. So the, the place where the council has been directly impacting this most is this um, the energy prices, both challenging the PUC about the decision that they made, but and and, and also um, about the hundred dollars that the governor wants to give out that 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 there's no means testing on that, um, but also pushing him to get the LIHEAP money out so that other people who are underserved, the those most needy among us are eligible for some funding. And we did just see that that there is gonna be a $405 um, payment for people um, that qualify under that program. And so, um, so that is the place where we have been able to push, but also the council has a role in really holding the governor accountable for getting this federal money out. And so the rental assistance money, we weren't, we weren't able to use all of that money. Some of that money had to go back. We don't wanna see that again. We really wanna to push to make sure that the rental assistance money is getting out. That money that there's money right now to restaurants um, that is, is the governor's office, the gopher office is not doing a very good job of communicating that 
that program out to restaurants. So, so many restaurants are eligible for this program. They don't know about it. So a large part of the council's role here when you talk about constituent services is reaching out and making sure that people know what is available to them. And one of the ways that I've done this is to by really getting to know every single city and town that I represent, what their needs are, so that when something comes up, I'm reminded, oh, that's right, that town needs this, this program would be good for them, reaching out and making sure that they that they do that and um, that they get those funds. And it's going to be a tough time ahead um, until we get inflation I'm under control. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you. And for our last question before, the um, closing statements, I'm going to go to Tom Opel, the chair of the Canaan Democrats. Um, yeah, thanks to both of you, Cindy and Mike, um, great public servants, and it's a shame that we have to choose, but thanks to the Republicans and uh, their awful redistricting plan. Um, and, Tom, and I think if you can just um, speak a little louder, I'm having a little bit of a difficulty hearing you. Uh, Okay, hopefully that'll, hopefully that'll be better. Um, I, I know that uh, the executive council position is obviously an executive position, not a legislative one. And I know that the secretary of state is elected by the legislature, but I'm wondering what both of you would do regarding the issue of, of protecting our democracy. Um, there are all sorts of threats to it, mostly uh, related, I think, around the issue of people being able to vote and this false narrative that has been promoted uh, by folks on the other side about voter fraud, even here in New Hampshire. And Secretary of State Scanlon has, has created this voter confidence committee, which my fear is, is doing more to raise questions about uh, voter confidence than it is to uh, restoring confidence. Um, as an executive counselor, you would have a platform. I'm wondering how you might use that platform uh, uh, in terms of doing what you can to promote and protect our democracy, whether here in the Hampshire or around the country, frankly. And we'll go first to Cindy. Sure, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, it, I, just so you know, um, my husband, Bill Christie, is the voting rights litigator um, in, in the state. He represents the New Hampshire Democratic Party and does all the voting rights litigation in the state. So we eat, drink, sleep, breathe voting rights in this house. And I have been part of that voter protection program as an attorney for many years. And you, you know, you are absolutely right at every level that our democracy is under assault from, we've seen it obviously the, what's going on in the January 6th hearings, um, an effort to overturn the will of the voters, but that on, on a smaller scale that is happening here in New Hampshire. When we see this gerrymandering that has just happened again on the executive council, the Senate, the house, this is you know an effort to dissuade people from voting, voter ID, making it harder for people to register, making it harder for people to vote because when, we vote as Democrats, we win and they know it. And so they need to do other things to undermine people's right to vote. That is wrong. As an executive counselor, that is one of the primary issues I, I look for in, a, in the judicial nominations and also um, raise up uh, at the executive council when the governor does things or doesn't do things that he should be doing to protect our democracy. We at the executive council, have a unique position, we get to question the governor every two weeks. The governor can ignore the legislature, and he does, he can ignore the media, but he cannot ignore the executive council. And now that we have really put in the infrastructure, the media is at executive council meetings and paying close attention to what's going on there. So it's made it very difficult for him to avoid being held accountable. And that's what we can do as executive counselors. Thank you, Cindy. And now we'll go to Mike. Oh, voting is such an important opportunity for all of us. Um, and, uh, and many of us know that probably the area that people that want to go after a group not to vote is they pick the colleges. And District 1, the old District 1 had Dartmouth College and Colby and Plymouth and, uh, you know, and up in, Ke in Berlin. And 
I asked the nominee for the Chief Justice of the Supreme, State Supreme Court, Gordon McDonald, I, I asked him a couple of questions about voting rights. And at the end, I said, you have a young daughter, I have a young son. I said, this is the time to get them voting, not to hear somebody come on TV and say, I haven't voted since I was ever, since now I'm 60, I'm voting, that kind of thing. We want to encourage people to vote. Um, I'm not in favor of uh, keep on going back and back and back and trying to find something that is not there. I think we have to move forward. And uh, New Hampshire has uh, always done a good job running its elections. And I think we should, instead of throwing up hurdles, we should uh, clear the hurdles off the track and let them run a 400 meter, not a 400 meter hurdle. And um, I think that's what we can do as counselors. Um, we, as I mentioned earlier, we're gonna have another Supreme Court justice nominee coming up in the next year. And we have to do better in getting someone that believes that voting rights are important. Thank you, Tom. All right, thank you very much, Mike. And I'm going to keep the spotlight on you because we are going to go to closing statements right now. As I mentioned earlier, each candidate will have two minutes for closing statements. We will start with Mike and then we will go to Cindy. Um, as you may recall, we started uh, opening statements. Cindy went first and Mike went second. And so we are doing the reverse. Sure. So Mike, I will turn it to you for closing statements. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the patience of all the people that were on board. I, this thing, I don't see how many, but I'm sure you had a, a pretty good turnout tonight. Uh, uh, and thank you for all the people that asked the questions. Um, this is an important election. And um, one of the things that I've heard from, from a number of people is, thank you for running because now we have a primary. Uh, we have a choice. And I think that's important to have a primary. That's what they're about is choices. And I will be running as hard as I can for the next roughly eight weeks to uh, be the executive counselor from the new district, District 2. Uh, as we all know, we've taken half of uh, District 2 and half of District 1 and melded them together and thrown in Bo in Peterborough and Sharon to help the Republicans be even stronger in the next election. And um, I will bring the same commitment because the first question I was asked before we actually even went on, are you still running? I will bring that same commitment each and every day if I'm elected to serve the constituents of District number two, which is 275,000 people, do the best I can. And I will bring that dedication, commitment, and perseverance to do a good job. So I won't force Deb to grab the 15 minutes. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, Mike. And thank you for being here this evening. I will now turn it to Cindy for closing remarks. Well, thank you all uh, for giving us your time on this. Um, even it's this warm summer evening. I appreciate everyone taking uh, taking the time to be here tonight. Um, for the past two years, I have been working very hard for the state of New Hampshire, for the people of our state, and to make sure that we have good representation on the executive council. I am excited to keep doing that work and to represent all of the new communities that are joining District Two. Um, I do want to say this that. A lot of people are very concerned about this election and I hear a lot of despair out there. And as I tell them, we have no time for that. I was once I once heard from the great Billy Shaheen when we were in a campaign and things weren't going well, he said to me, don't worry, work. And that is what we can do. And I will do that as a candidate and I will do that every single day as I have the last two years for, as an executive counselor. And I think it's been very important on the executive council that I have, I have led from a 4-1 minority, but I really look forward to a time when I would not be in that minority. And so for the last two years, I have been raising money to make sure that we take back the majority, recruited all of the four candidates from the other districts and paid staff to launch their campaigns, and I continue to work for them. I am very, very proud um, to have the endorsement, not only of the congressional delegation, but more than 50 of the representatives of the 61 uh, Democratic representatives in the new district, more than 50 have endorsed my candidacy, and I thank them all for that. 
And I think I have shown that I can lead in the most difficult of circumstances. And I can only imagine what we'll be able to do once we have a majority. And I think that that is, um, that is what we can do if we um, really put our shoulders to the wheel in this election. Don't worry, work. Let's go win this. We can do this. And I um, humbly ask for your vote on September 13th. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to both Cindy Warmington, current executive counselor for District 2, and Mike Cryens, former executive counselor for District 1, um, who is now also running for the new executive council District 2. There is a third candidate in this primary election. You will see a third name on the ballot as well. His name is Bradford Todd, and he is from Keene, New Hampshire, or lives in Keene, New Hampshire. Um, we did reach out to him to participate in tonight's candidate forum, and we did not hear back. Um, we hope that uh, we may have a chance to hear from him. And if uh, we do, I will make arrangements for Upper Valley Democrats to have a chance to um, interact with him and learn about his uh, positions on the issues. Um, we do have an important election on September 13th. Uh, we do have about eight weeks left. And so in the last four minutes that we have, I would first like to acknowledge that we do have um, some very special guests this evening. Our, um, I see that our state senator, of course, we already heard from her, Sue Prentice is here. We also have state representatives. I know that I saw Sharon Nordgren, State Representative Susan Almy, State Representative Mary Hawkins Phillips, State Representative James Murphy, and um, did I see State Representative Richard Abel as well. Um, we also have guests from across, not just Grafton County. Uh, we did hear from our chairs from the Hanover and Lebanon chairs, as well as the Grafton County chairs. I also would like to welcome Mohamed Saleh, who is chair of the Cheshire County Democrats. I see that Maureen, Maureen from the New London Democrats is with us, as well as Catherine Bouchef from the Sunapee Democrats and Sam Pillay from the Claremont Democrats. And so I want to extend a special welcome to all of our guests. And I apologize if I missed anyone. Um, if you would like to be added, I will send out a recording of the candidate forum. If you would like to be added to our email list so that you can receive that recording, just send an email to uvdems at gmail.com. I will add you to our email list and then you will receive the, um, the link to the uh, candidate forum in just a couple of days. Finally, I would like to say that Organized New Hampshire is here in the Upper Valley. I know they are active throughout the state, but they have opened an office in downtown West Lebanon. They are now conducting canvassing, knocking on doors, which we are back to this election cycle. And I'm so happy because we know that this matters in terms of turning out a strong democratic vote. And so if you would like to be part of canvassing efforts, you can be in touch with Sam Weiss and Jazz. I can't remember their last name, um, but they're with Organized New Hampshire and I will put their, their email contact information in the next email that I send out as well so that you can connect with them and be a part of the door knocking um, efforts. Lynn Garfield also says that they have yard signs which are starting to appear. Uh, and so if you are interested in yard signs, uh, you can also be in touch with them. Upper Valley Democrats will be ramping up our own efforts over the coming weeks as we want to draw greater attention to the issues and to the values that matter. We need to turn out, our job as Upper Valley Democrats is to turn out a big vote because we know that when Senator Maggie Hassan was only elected by 1,017 votes six years ago, we know that that can be the difference of an enthusiastic uh, group of Democrats here in the Upper Valley. And so things that we're going to be doing will be writing letters to the editor and highlighting issues. 
Uh, I am also looking for help with managing our digital presence. So if you would like to be involved in helping with our website, keeping it updated, or perhaps on social media, we have Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and we could use help ramping up our efforts there as well. And lastly, the Upper Valley Democrats have agreed to support to make contributions, monetary contributions to competitive districts. There are some competitive house districts and there is also an effort being put on by the Grafton County Democrats to support races in throughout Grafton County. And uh, we need to raise a little more money so that we can support those competitive races. And so I would also like to plant the seed that um, if anyone is interested in helping to plan an event for September, an in-person event of some sort that could help to raise those funds to support candidates, I will be asking for volunteers to be on a committee to work on that as well. I'll include those volunteer options in my next email. So please send an email to uvdems at gmail.com in order to be added to our list. And I see that it is 7.15 and so, respectful of all of your time, I will say thank you so much for joining us this evening and onward. Let's all work to make it a very blue New Hampshire this September and November. Thank you.